So from a deployment standpoint, um, you know, there are four major components that every deployment has. So first one, orchestrator deployment and considerations include high availability and scalability. Um, I'll show an architecture diagram later with a high availability setup um, and disaster recovery and automatic failover strategy. So determining what to do if, you know, if the server fails, uh, if something fails, like, is, is everything just gonna get stuck and stop and fail or is there a disaster you know, recovery approach there? And then uh, considering whether you wanna do it on-prem or cloud-based, um, that also is a decision that um, the robot deployment also um, touches on. Um, nowadays, we have on-prem and cloud-based option. A few years ago, it's mostly, it's just on-prem. But nowadays, there, there are a few things that we, we, we would look at in order to uh, determine that. And we'll go over that. And then operating system environment, you know, Windows workstation environment or Windows server environment, operating infra environment, VDI or VM, you know, underlying subsystem availability and integration, ease of upscaling during peak loads and off-peak downscaling. So if you have a process that, um, that where the volume is not always consistent, then you know, how to handle and manage the resources of the robot in peak periods versus um, periods where volume is low. It's, so that's a consideration as well. So let's talk a bit about on-prem versus cloud-based. So this usually comes down to the availability of resources. The on-prem deployment can be costly um, to spin up, especially if you know if the client is trying to do ML or DU. The machines that you need to run an ML model are fairly costly on-premise because of the hardware requirements. So sometimes the clients, they don't always understand how much resources processes actually need. There, there was uh, one client that our team worked with where they had a hundred robots. They were processing 7,000 records a day. And they were wondering how some of the jobs were struggling to start and they were hanging, getting stuck a lot. And what they did not tell us was like, when we were bought on board to help troubleshoot was that for everybody and, and their orchestrator, they did the bare minimum requirements, um, like the bare minimum um, uh, specs on the web page. And so, you know, when you're looking at the volume metrics and you're looking at how many bots are um, you're going to want to run for this process to be successful, um, like the resources for the hardware are a very important consideration that the clients don't always think about right up front. Another difference between on-prem and cloud-based is, for example, you know, there are several clients where their security policies make it impossible or very difficult to use cloud-based. One example is um, HIPAA data you know, for hospitals or even you know, sometimes banks, you know, high security environments. So HIPAA data, sensitive data, they often cannot be processed through any of our cloud products. So if you're working with someone like, you know, hospitals or Kaiser or Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, any place that's going to be processing uh, medical data, it's pretty much guaranteed that it's going to have to be on-prem. Um, so, you know, those are the kinds of things that we, we think about when when we make that uh, cloud versus on-prem on consideration. And then um, package deployment. So, for package deployment, there are many ways to go about that. We've seen several clients approaching it different ways. Um, so there are some support native and UiPath for CI CD. So we've got plugins to where you can use Jenkins now to deploy packages to the different environments. And there's also, I mean, if you've got a source control, then what you can do is some clients will have a staging environment and on there, they will have like one instance of studio installed and they will use that to check out the code from the source control and then build a package with that and deploy that to staging. And then, um, you know, there's the just publishing the package directly from dev into the staging folder and then from staging into production. Um, there's an option to, you, you can just manually upload the package into the production server. Um, so people do that. Uh, so there are any number of different ways we've seen um, package deployment going. Um, the main consideration there is you want to be as you, you want it to be a scalable way where 
you can track and deploy even as your program scales up. Um, and um, you know, one question from the last solution architect training we got was, at what stage do we normally see clients go to a source control, a good source control? You know, the first automation maybe just a pilot or POC, so they might not necessarily do that on day one as they're just learning the process. So how how early should they get something in terms of version control rather than just you know, going to deploying packages to either dev or test or even production environments. So our recommendation is always to push to get a version control system set up right away, actually, you know, even if it is just a pilot or POC, because there have been projects where because they they were POC, after they finished the POC, their actual you know continuation of, of their development was delayed for whatever reason. And then you know, some months later, they come back around and they want some services to continue building out their automation. And, and you know, then the team want to see what all happened with the POC and how it was developed. And, and they've lost all of it at some point because they didn't version control it. So, you know, ultimately, it's going to expand your effort and timeline if, um, if it's not, you know, uh, kept track of well. So we recommend um, using version control as soon as you can. So that's one of the risks. Um, you know, we want to hatch against that and basically get them to do it as soon as possible. Um, but if they don't want to do version control for the POC because it's just a small little thing and, you know, I don't know if it's going to work and if they're going to want to keep going and setting up version control, it seems like too much of a headache, too much effort up front um, just to prove out that one small little process with no re real volume, then... You know, if that's the case, then at least getting it set up when their main development effort starts. So when the POC is done, they've decided they like what they saw, they want to work on getting some more processes going, then definitely set up source control then, um, you know, especially if it's a client who wants to spin up a full COE, it's gonna it, it's a good time to get it in there and you know, let them know that the CICD is a good practice to get started right away. So um, you know, moving on to credential deployment, um, there are, again, a lot of different ways to manage credential deployment. There are some clients where they will have their security IT teams just go into production orchestrator and manually add any of the assets with credentials because they don't want anyone else to see what's going on with that. Um, there are times when it's not a best practice, but but we've seen it. So just letting you guys know, there are times when there have been clients who had all of their credentials in an Excel spreadsheet and, and the Excel sheet was in an encrypted shared drive. So it was at least marginally protected. What they did was at the beginning of the process, every time they would unlock that drive location, open the Excel spreadsheet, and they would you know just pull whatever assets needed for credentials out of there as the process was running. So obviously it's it's a bad idea, um, but they didn't like that the credentials were in orchestrator where quote unquote anyone could get at them. Um, so they liked that it was just in a secure folder on the network that was hidden from everybody. And another way, uh, a common way is uh, using the Windows Credentials Manager. Um, so you can use the Credential Manager uh, with an on-prem server. Basically the credentials themselves, when you're using Windows Credential Manager, they don't travel between the robot machine and the orchestrator machine. Um, so what happens is the robot is pulling the orchestrator and when it hits the orchestrator and sees that there are tasks it needs to do, the orchestrator sends back a response um, in any of the credentials that need to be managed. The Windows Credential Manager will authenticate them on the robot side and then tell the orchestrator, yeah, it's good to go now. And so the orchestrator itself doesn't see any of those credentials from the credential manager. It just double checks with the credential manager that everything is okay. Um, so some clients use, use this approach, um, use their Windows credential manager on everything. Um, so it's a common practice to manage it. So some questions from the group, uh, you know, what, what are uh, some considerations that you had to make or you have seen that's not already on this slide here. Any Anything on any of the bullet points here that, that hits you?
any challenges you've seen or you're anticipating in terms of deployment considerations? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's get on to the deployment options then. Um, so there, there are a few options. This is the first one. This is the simplest deployment option. When you're setting up a deployment, you know, the simplest option is to just, um, it's just gonna be like a series of robots tied to one single orchestrator, the web application, and then with a SQL server and possibly an elastic search server, um, which is optional for um, if you're using Kibana. So that's about as basic as you can get. Um, the elastic search is a NoSQL um, distributed full text database and search engine. So this the, the elastic search database is document based rather than you know using classic database tables and it does not require a specific schema for the data being stored. So the advantage is you know, there's a lot of flexibility and this flexibility allows UiPath to send log messages without specifying in advance what fields are there. So the named index in Elasticsearch may have a very different structure that can still be retrieved and, and queried very efficiently and quickly. And then for Kibana, um, in case you, you're looking at it, it, it's an open source analytics and visualization platform designed to you know, work in combination with Elasticsearch. Um, and it helps you create custom views based on the logs that you collected um, that you send to Elasticsearch. In our case, the ones sent by robots, basically you use Kibana to search, view, and interact with data stored in Elasticsearch indexes. Here, example of, um, of another setup. Um, this one is high performance, high availability deployment. So you've got all of the robots, but they, they're a low balance between two orchestrators instead of one. And then you've got the Reddit's um, master in the middle to keep the two orchestrators in sync with each other so that they know what's going on. Um, and so the low balancer helps keep it high performance because it distributes the robots across the orchestrators, but it also makes it high availability. So using the load balancer to direct all of the traffic to just one orchestrator if the other orchestrator goes down. And then when we look at disaster recovery, we've got the high performance, high availability orchestrator set up over here on the left. And then we've got the disaster recovery data center um, on the right. And so for some reason, if for some reason, both of your orchestrators go down and you can't load balance between the two of them, then you've got a copy of your environment over in the data center. So depending on how often um, they make snapshots of the SQL server, there may be instances where if the orchestrator goes down in the middle of the process, it might not be able to pick up where it left off because the information from that SQL server might not have been snapshotted and moved over. So when you're looking at disaster recovery, one of the considerations you need to um, talk with the client about is if some kind of disaster happens, how recoverable do they want it to be? So let's say if you've got a process with like 100,000 records, and you're 50,000 of them in and it dies, if it fails over to the data or recovery center, do you want it to be able to pick up exactly where it left off with those 50,000? Or are they okay with you know, processing the remaining 50,000 and the first half will finish when the primary node comes back up? Or will the first half just be rewrite later on the disaster recovery node? Um, and if they want all, 100,000 to be processed and finished, then you, know, you might need to consider a snapshot that SQL Server more frequently. So if you've got like a large amount of data that you, you might need to fail over, then you wanna make, make sure that your SQL Server has powerful enough hardware to be able to snapshot it without affecting the performance of the system. And whether you want the primary SQL Server snapshot to be 
you know, daily or multiple times a day, or if for some reason you think it needs to be snapshot like once a minute, um, then you know, be sure to consider what kind of hardware you would need to, to be able to pull that off. So those are you know, some of the considerations that you would need to think about. Um, for disaster recovery setup, a lot of it is just discussing how much you want to recover should a disaster happen. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to this channel for upcoming content on how to start or build a career in tech, how to automate using low code RPA, how to build real time low code data pipelines, and other tech content.